Public policy. The policymaking process in Iran is highly complex because laws can originate in many places, not just the legislature. It can also be blocked by other state institutions. Also, policies are subject to change depending on factional control. The two most important policymaking institutions in Iran are the Majlis and the Guardian Council, with the Expediency Council refereeing disputes between the two. Policymaking factions. The leaders of the revolution of 1979 and their supporters agreed on one thing. They wanted the Shah to abdicate. Most people also wanted the Ayatollah Khomeini to lead the country after the Shah left. After that, the disagreements began and continue until this day. Two types of factions are conservative versus reformist. By and large, these factions are created by the often contradictory influences of theocracy and democracy. Conservatives uphold the principles of the regime as set up in 1979, with its basis in strict Sharia law with a minimum of modern modifications. They are wary of influence from the Western countries and warn that modernization may threaten the tenets of Shiism that provide the moral basis for society, politics, and the economy. They support the right and responsibility of clerics to run the political system, and they believe that political and religious decisions should be one and the same. Reformists, on the other hand, believe that the political system needs significant reform, although they disagree on exactly what the reform should be. They are less wary of Western influence, and they tend to advocate some degree of international involvement with countries of the West. Most reformers support Shiism, and believe it to be an important basis of Iranian society, but they often support the idea that political leaders do not necessarily have to be clerics. Status versus free marketers. This rift cuts across conservatives and reformers, and has taken different meanings over the years. Basically, though, the statists believe that the government should take an active role in controlling the economy, redistributing land and wealth, eliminating unemployment, financing social welfare programs, and placing price ceilings on consumer goods. We have seen this point of view at work in Mexico under Lazaro Cardenas during the 1930s, and in Russia and China under communism. Statists are not necessarily communists, and few in Iran are. But the same philosophy directed the economy of the Soviet Union with its five-year plans, and continues to direct China's socialist market economy. On the other hand, the free marketers want to remove price controls, lower business taxes, encourage private enterprise, and balance the budget. In many ways, they believe in the same market principles that guide the United States, but they envision it working within the context of the theocratic democratic state. These factional disputes have often brought about gridlock and instability, such as the flip-flop that occurred in the modulus between the election of 2000 and 2004, from reformist to conservative control. The disputes among the factions have led many of Iran's best and brightest to leave the country, and have deprived the reformists in particular of some potentially good leadership. Factions have also led to confusion on the international scene as well. For example, after the September 11, 2001 attacks in the United States, President Hatami almost immediately extended his condolences to the American people. However, Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei forbade any public debate about improving relations with the United States, and also implied that Americans had brought the situation on themselves. President Hassan Rouhani included a broad number of factions in his cabinet selections in 2013, appointing moderate reformists from President Hatami's administration technocrats from President Rafsanjani's administration, and moderate conservatives, who are the closest political alignment to a centrist party. Still, factional splits threaten the stability of any president's cabinet, and Rouhani's success will also depend on the relationship he forms with Supreme Leader Khamenei. The Importance of Qum The legitimacy of the modern Iranian theocracy has its roots in Qum, a desert city about 60 miles south of Tehran. It was from Qum that Ayatollah Khomeini began to denounce the Shah, and it was from there that he set up his government after returning from exile in France. It is a city of seminaries, and the scholars that inhabit them help to define the very foundations of Iranian society. Ironically, despite the fact that Khomeini's doctrine of Velayat i Faqih was devised in Qum, many scholars there are not entirely comfortable with the theocratic state. Their debate frames the factionalism of Iranian politics. From some perspectives, the only rightful union of religion and politics will occur when the twelfth imam returns from hiding. Until then, these scholars say, men of religion should be careful not to get involved in politics, and no one has special authority to guide society during this period called occultation, between the disappearance and the return of the twelfth imam. 
Therefore, Valet al Faqeh is invalid because it endows the supreme leader and other government structures with divine authority. President Hatameh's reform movement drew heavily on the views of clerics that see politics as an experimental man-made activity that Islam should respect. These pragmatists, of course, clashed with conservative religious scholars who agree with the doctrine of Valayat al and the divine authority that it implies, and their points of view are very influential in the reversal of Hatami's reforms under President Ahmadinejad. The presidential candidates who challenged the 2009 election results appealed directly to the scholars of Qum without challenging Valayat al Faqeh as a doctrine. The response from Qum was mixed, with one group of mid ranking scholars and a few senior clergy denouncing the election as a fraud, but most kept quiet. However, the election and its aftermath no doubt fueled disagreements among clerics, further factionalizing the country. Economic Issues The factional disagreements within the political elite are apparent in Iran's struggles with economic policymaking. On the international scene in 2002, a bill was drafted in the modulus that would have permitted foreigners to own as much as 100%, up from 48%, of any firm in the country. Not surprisingly, the bill came from the Performance. Predictably, the bill was not approved by the Guardian Council, a reflection of the tug of war between reformists and conservatives. Domestically, most Iranian leaders want improved standards of living for the people, but conservatives are cautious about the influence of secular prosperity on devout Shiism. Oil has created a vertical divide in the society, particularly among the elites. On one side are elites with close ties to the oil state. On the other side is the traditional sector of the clergy. It was this divide that was clearly evident during the revolution of 1979, and despite the fact that the clerics won, the secularists have not gone away. Almost no one denies the benefits that oil has brought to Iran. Money from the rentier state that grew under Mohammad Reza Shah helped to build the economic infrastructure that fueled the growth of a middle class. By the 1970s, Iran was clearly an industrializing country with increasing prosperity and its economy was integrated into the world economy. The Ayatollah Khomeini famously stated that economics is for donkeys, disdaining the importance of economics for policymakers and affirming the superiority of religious rather than secular leaders. Even conservatives today don't deny the importance of economic policy decisions. But the factions don't agree on whether or not secularists should be allowed to make policy. The main economic problem plaguing the Islamic Republic has been the instability in the price of oil. The country suffered greatly when oil prices plunged in the early 1980s, rebounded somewhat, and then dropped again in the 1990s. Prices stayed relatively low until the end of the century. After that, oil prices have rebounded, and the Iranian economy benefited but again suffered when the prices fell in 2014. The management of the economy has been criticized, especially under President Ahmadinejad. He was elected based on his promises to provide government subsidies for consumers, and government expenditures on subsidies increased to about 25% of Iran's GDP in 2005 to 2006. The programs include food, housing, and bank credit, and perhaps most controversially, gasoline. In two th until 2011, gasoline was priced so low that domestic refiners refused to raise production to meet demand so Iran had to import about 40% of its oil. This situation encouraged oil smuggling to neighboring countries and corruption among the quasi-state companies that deal in oil products. The global economic recession that began in late 2007 impacted Iran deeply, especially the dramatic decline in the price of oil in 2008. In 2010, the government made a bold announcement that major reforms would end many economic subsidies, especially those that encourage people to waste precious resources. By dropping subsidies, the government allowed prices of oil, gas, electricity, and other basic commodities to reach market levels. And within a month of the president's announcements of the reforms, the price of gasoline had gone up by 75%, and that of diesel by more than 2,000%. Electricity and water bills also increased, as did the price of some types of bread. Supported by state television, President Ahmadinejad pointed out that the old system favored the rich, whose lifestyles included heating big houses and fueling multiple cars, were subsidized by the cheap commodities. Indeed, the reforms were structured so that the more water, gas, and electricity an Iranian consumes, the more expensive these utilities become. In order to compensate ordinary Iranians for raising prices closer to world levels, the government has given monthly cash transfers to families. These reforms have reduced waste and encouraged conservation, and yet the cash transfers have kept people from openly protesting or resisting the changes. Even so, 
Today, almost all Iranians receive cash transfers intended for the poor, with the government spending $100 billion in subsidies in 2013. With the arms agreement in mid-2015, many hoped that the lifting of sanctions, the, econ the economy would turn around, but inefficiencies abound, making Iran's economic future uncertain. In order for President Rouhani to address the country's economic problems, he turned his attention to foreign policy to find a way to ease international sanctions imposed on Iran because of its nuclear activities. In 2015, Iran's oil exports had dwindled to half their former levels, GDP had fallen, currency rates had plunged, and unemployment had risen, risen sharply. Rouhani's success as president depends heavily on his ability to resuscitate the economy. Population policy. One major initiative of the government in recent years has been to bring down the overall birth rate in Iran. The population surged after the revolution of 1979, when Iranians were encouraged to have large families. As a result, the percentage of young people in the country grew tremendously, placing pressure on schools and eventually the workforce. Unemployment rates increased as too many young people sought the same jobs, so the clergy approved policies to lower the birth rate and reduce long-term burdens from overpopulation. Beginning in the late 1980s, the government reversed its policy and began discouraging large families. This new emphasis occurred at the same time that greater educational and professional opportunities opened to women. So the fertility rate declined, especially in urban areas. Although the population will continue to grow for some time because there are still so many young people of childbearing age, the government appears to have reversed the population crisis. Today, the effects of these policy shifts is evident, with Iran fast becoming a middle-aged country. Those born in the early years of the Republic are now in their late 20s, 30s, and early 40s, and they create an ever-aging bubble in the population pyramid. Birth rates are down, with experts estimating 1.6 to 1.9 children per woman of childbearing age, broadly in line with European rates. Foreign Affairs Iran's international profile was raised considerably by President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, whose statements and actions were quite, quite controversial. He became the most polarizing head of government in the Muslim world when he declared the Holocaust a myth and argued that Israel would be wiped away. After that, he threatened to retaliate against American interests in every part of the world if the U.S. were to attack Iran. His 2006 letter to George W. Bush inviting him to a televised discussion about their differences was openly published in newspapers, and although Bush declined, Ahmadinejad received a great deal of international publicity for his gesture. He held regular press conferences with Western journalists, and he traveled widely, yet the stance that he generally took was to defend Iran against the reset rest of the world, particularly the West, reinforcing the historical perception of an isolated country. President Rouhani has a long record of experience in international relations. He, like many other Iranian leaders, sees the United States and other Western countries as permanently in conflict with Iran. However, he has expressed concern over Iran's brain drain, exit of scholars to the West, and he has supported membership in the World Trade Organization. During his years as Secretary of the National Security Council, Mr. Rouhani prevented hardliners from forming an alliance with Saddam Hussein after Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990 according to the New York Times in July 27, 2013 article. He also directed Iran's negotiations with Western countries in 2003, which resulted in an agreement in 2003, the only nuclear deal between Iran and the West in the past 11 years. The attitudes toward international organizations such as the United Nations, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization are mixed. Iran's application to join the WTO in 1996 failed in part because of the difficulties in making foreign investments within the country's borders. The application also failed because the United States opposed it, so these hostilities between the two countries have reverberated into many areas of international economic policy. Iran's most important international membership is probably in OPEC, the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries, that controls the price of oil exported from its member states. Iran has long sought to spread its influence throughout the Middle East, an effort that benefited after the United States removed hostile regimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. The Quds Force has exploited the region's instability, carrying out assassinations and bombings, and supplying arms and training to militias deemed helpful to its interests. Syrian President Assad relies on Iran for cash, advice, and training for its paramilitary fighters. Nuclear energy. States like these, Iran, Iraq, and North Korea, and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil arming to threaten the peace of the world. 
by seeking weapons of mass destruction, these regime regimes pose a grave and growing danger. They could provide those arms to terrorists, giving them the means to match their hatred. They could attack our allies or attempt to blackmail the United States. U.S. President George W. Bush, State of the Union Address, January 29, 2002. President Bush's Axis of Evil statement quoted above created a stir of controversy regarding Iran's international relations with Western countries. Iran's nuclear program goes back many decades, but this program has been under serious scrutiny by Western nations since the attacks on the United States in September 11, 2001. Iran has maintained that the purpose of its nuclear program was for the generation of power, not for use as weapons. However, in August 2002, a leading critic of the regime revealed two secret nuclear sites a uranium enrichment facility in Natanz, and a heavy water facility in Arak. Late in 2003, the U.S. insisted that Iran be held accountable for allegedly seeking to build nuclear arms in violation of international treaties, including the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty that Iran had signed. Then, in November 2004, Iran's chief nuclear negotiator announced that Iran had temporarily suspended the uranium enrichment program after pressure from the European Union. This dispute boiled over in August 2005, when the International Atomic Energy Agency announced that Iran had broken seals on one of its nuclear sites, seals that had been in place there by the United Nations in 2004. In 2006, Britain, France, and Germany offered Iran trade, civil nuclear assistance, and a promise of talks with America if it stopped enriching the uranium that could produce the fuel for a bomb. When Iran refused, Diplomacy led in December 2006 to the imposition of formal economic sanctions by the United Nations Security Council. Years of diplomacy efforts followed, and finally in mid-2015, Iran, the United States, and five other world powers reached an agreement about the future of Iran's nuclear program. Important parts of the agreement include limits on Iran's nuclear programs. Iran agreed to turn its Fordo facility, a site where many experts believe Iran was enriching uranium in centrifuges, into a research center where Iran, Iranian and world scientists would work together. Iran also agreed to rebuild its Arak facility so that the production of weapons-grade plutonium would be impossible. Iran also agreed to give up most of its centrifuges, which are used to enrich uranium. Continuation of Enrichment Iran has long contended that its nuclear program is focused on peaceful purposes, so the agreement allowed Iran to use its Natanz facilities for those purposes. However, levels of enrichment were limited so that the building of weapons would be impossible. Extension of the breakout time President Obama argued that the deal extends the time it would take Iran to make enough highly enriched material for a nuclear bomb. However, the agreement has time was time limits, so it is unclear what might happen when it expires. Sanctions may return. If Iran does not comply with the agreement, the UN Security Council may vote to reinstate sanctions on Iran. Comprehensive inspections. Inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency would have continual access to Iranian facilities, especially if any suspicious activity occurs. This agreement will no doubt impact Iran's economic future as well as its relations with other countries, especially the United States. Since the terms of the agreement began to expire 10 to 15 years from the time of the agreement, critics say that it only delays the Iranians' ability to obtain a nuclear weapon, and so is not a long-term solution. Iran's complex political culture and internal factional debates make it very difficult to predict its future. Oil continues to fill the government's coffers with income, but the economy's dependence on one product is worrisome to economists and politicians alike especially after the price of oil plummeted in 2008 and again in 2014. Iran's unique political system is a bold experiment and tests the questions as to whether or not it is possible for a theocracy to be democratic. Another major theme in government and politics that Iran's case raises is the relationship between religion and politics. Is a democracy possible without separating the two into different spheres? Does the state benefit from being based on religious principles that are meant to guide human life in general? On the other hand, does religion increase tensions in the relationship between citizens and state so that government loses its objectivity and essential fairness to its citizens? For these reasons, and more, the evolution of Iran's political system is interesting to watch and vital to understand.